Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here. Uh, I've been only once to Denmark before, about 15 years ago, as a tourist. So now I'm turning back as a missionary of Austrian economics. I didn't anticipate at the time. Uh, at the time, I think I didn't even know what Austrian economics was. But so, so here we are, 15 years later. A lot of water has flown down the Rhine and the Öresund. Um, as I always say to my, my students in Angers that um, uh, the, the reason why I constantly stop my lectures about 10 or 15 minutes uh, before I'm supposed to is because that, as a professor with a fixed salary, it's the only way to increase your real weight rate. Okay. Uh, now here they're, they're cutting the, the lunch breaks and I guess in, instead of salmon and, and, and mussels and, and so on, we'll, we'll get a smurrowbird. Um, now that, that's a kind of a decrease of, of, of a, of a non-monetary wage rate, right? So I've, I've learned something from my Danish friends. Again, uh, our subject this morning is Mises and the Austrian School. And uh, so it was a wise decision to cut down uh, the lunch breaks rather than have me drop every eighth word because then the sentences wouldn't make much sense. Uh, so Mises, uh, I guess, you know, certain things about him, other, otherwise he wouldn't have shown up here. Mises, is, in a word, is the most important economist of the 20th century, and he happens to be um, a member of the Austrian school. As far as I'm concerned, that probably holds true for Hans Hermann Hoppe and many others too. Uh, one reason, or probably the most essential reason why I would call myself uh, an Austrian economist is because I'm convinced that Mises' work is just uh, the most solid basis that we have for further elaboration. That doesn't have to mean, of course, that we accept every word that Mises ever wrote at face value, uh, but it means that uh, in very important respects, both as far as substantive issues are concerned, but also questions as epistemology and methodology and so on, he is far superior to, or his work is far superior to the work of any of his main competitors. Um, which leads me to a related observation, Austrian school. Well, um, in a way, one could say that Mises just, of course, uh, uh, continued uh, continue to build up economic science as it was handed down from, well, a couple of previous economists starting in the 18th century. So in a way, I would say the Austrian school today is, well, the only school of economists that has, uh, has survived, whereas all others uh, have fallen away from uh, economic science. They've started doing something else. They've started doing applied mathematics. Uh, they've uh, started playing uh, uh, econometric games and so on, which has not much to do with economics. Right? Today, one, we are in a phase of a great crisis of economic teaching, uh, both in the, on the European continent, but also in the US, for example, uh, where many uh, students are fleeing the discipline. They're stopping being interested in, in economics and so on. They're turning toward other disciplines. And one important reason is that um, economic science seems to be devoid of meaning. Right? It uh, doesn't seem to be related to uh, real economic life, to real human life. And uh, it seems to be by and large just an exercise in uh, mathematical formalizing and modeling, as it is called, and in uh, testing that never leads to any valid and serious uh, insights. Uh, so people are turning away from this. And uh, economics, certainly, as it is practiced in, in most departments today, unfortunately, as, uh, especially as far as research is concerned, is, in fact, very different than from economics as it has emerged in the 18th and 19th century, and as it is still practiced today in a more refined form by Austrian economists. So the reason why we call ourselves Austrian economists rather than uh, ec only economists is just a question of product differentiation. Okay, if I say I'm an economist, well, nobody would say, okay, that's just an economist, just as the other guys. So uh, I want, uh, there's no, no reason for me to attend his lectures or his classes and so on. But if I say I'm an Austrian economist, people know, oh, so that's a different branch, right? It's a different product. Uh, it's, it's not just ice cream, it's just, it's whatever, uh, Eddie and Mike's ice cream or so. It's not just a car, it's a Mercedes. And so what you get here is then the Mercedes in economics, where else elsewhere you get the Fiat Pandas. So Mises uh, and the Austrian school. The Austrian school starts 
uh, with, with the work of Karl Menger, about whom I will say more. Uh, but Mises is in fact the central figure in the history of the Austrian school because he transformed what Austrian economics is in many important respects, about which I will say later on. So with this at, uh, at the beginning, uh, Mises in fact is not just in, in a straight line, continuous line, there are breaks there. And Mises brings about important breaks, even as, as far as his relation with Menga is concerned. And there are continuities which allow us to speak of both of these men as belonging to the same school and which, in fact, set them apart from all other schools that exist today. So in the Austrian school, then, we need to uh, distinguish between, or it is useful to distinguish between main a main line of Austrian economists and a s various side lines. The main line of Austrian economists starts with Karl Menger. Who lived during this period, 1840 to 1921, and uh, extends through Eugen from, of, uh, von <clears throat> and then extends through Mises. So here we have our central figure, Ludwig von Mises, 1883, 1973, and then to Murray Rothbard and his present day followers. So we have here 1926 to 1995. And then after Rothbard would have to say the main line is continued today, mainly by, not only, but mainly by scholars affiliated with the Ludwig von Mises Institute in, uh, in Alabama in the United States. Uh, so in particular by Professor Hoppe, uh, Professor Salerno, uh, Professor Herbner, myself and others. Um, and then we have, so this is the main line of uh, Austrian economics, and I will uh, explain in, um, in more detail what uh, the common characteristics of this main line is. Essentially, it's a dedication to uh, realist economic theory. I'll say more about what this is later on. And then we have a sideline, uh, the most important sideline of Austrian economists that starts with Friedrich von Wieser, who was not um, uh, inspired, whereas uh, Pim Bavek derived his uh, main uh, inspiration from Menga and continued, uh, continued the Mengarian uh, project, Visa was at least equally much inspired by an English economist by the name of Jevons, okay, uh, which made Visa more uh, likely to uh, adopt positivistic habits of, uh, of economic reasoning that are correct, uh, characteristic today of what the mainstream economists are doing. And in fact, all of Visa's main contributions uh, have been absorbed by mainstream economists today. So Visa's most important uh, pupil was Hayek. Friedrich August von Hayek. And the most important disciple, intellectual heir to Hayek was Israel Kirzner, 1930 to our present day. Kirzner was also a student of Mises, so Kirzner is not a uh, Hayekian purebred, but uh, he in fact developed the most important themes in uh, Hayek's economics, not so much business cycle theory, but especially Hayek's theory of economic prices, transmitting knowledge, and so on. And then in the present day, well, uh, the branch, uh, this branch is in a crisis. There's no uh, clear-cut hair who is still continuing uh, this project. There are various contenders to the throne. Uh, we don't have to deal with them today. We are mainly interested in this branch here. So what I will do in my talk now is to, uh, give you a brief introduction to Menger's work and then talk somewhat about Bimbabek and then go into more detail 
as far as uh, Mises is concerned. So the main line then starts with uh, a book that Karl Menger wrote in 1871, that he published in 1871, with the title Grundsätze der Volkswirtschaftslehre, Principles of Economics. Okay. And in this book, uh, Mies, uh, Menger uh, proposed a new uh, economic theory of value and prices uh, that is more precisely made one uh, great contribution that is to explain market prices based on the principle of marginal value, about which I will say more in my second lecture today. Um, but um, So whereas uh, previous economists had explained uh, prices as a function of or as uh, resulting from costs of production, Menger explained prices in terms of the needs of consumers and their readiness to pay uh, prices for these uh, consumer goods on the market. And the prices for the consumer goods being paid on the market are then imputed backwards on the prices of uh, producers' goods and so on. So we have a unified theory of value that explains all market prices by one pervading common principle, which is the principle of marginal value. Okay. Now, what makes Menger's theory so interesting is um, can be explained in comparison to uh, the theory that was developed about at the same time by William Stanley, Stanley Jevons, an English economist, and uh, Leon Valras, a French economist living in Switzerland, in Lausanne, who developed very similar theories. So all three thinkers developed a price theory or proposed a price theory at about the same time, in the early 1870s, in which they explained market prices on the principle of marginal value. Right? And if you go to uh, economics, uh, or if you're an economics student, who is an economics student here? Okay, so not all, but there's, there's a number. Right? So in economics classes today, we still explain prices based on these principles. Right? We, when we learn the theory of prices, we start with some observations about marginal value or marginal utility, as it is usually called, and then explain prices as a, as a function, as a, as a resultant, as a consequence of marginal utility. Okay, so and so far there, there's, uh, there's agreement. What makes Menger's theory interesting is that he gave a realistic account of this whole phenomenon. Right? Whereas Jevons and Varas developed a theory of marginal utility that was mainly fictitious, Right, was a, a fictitious uh, uh, speculation that could not be directly verified or falsified right, by information that was at, at hand, Menger developed a realistic account of marginal value. So he didn't use the word marginal utility. By the way, he didn't even use the word marginal value. Right? He said um, he used a more complicated way of circumscribing the phenomenon. What was important in any case was uh, the value of individual units of a good uh, about which a choice was being made. Okay. Uh, so in Menger's theory, then, all um, uh, values and prices are um, uh, explained by a descriptive theory. So the, the theory is itself describes elements of reality. It's not... Uh, a hypothesis or a fictional stipulation that we make at the beginning of our reasoning and then we make various deductions from it. But he starts from describing various elements of, uh, of, human, of, of real human life. For example, human beings do have needs. Right? The needs have different importance. So they have, there's a ranking between uh, the, the needs. Every individual good satisfies a concrete uh, and discrete uh, individual uh, need. And so as a consequence, the different individual goods have different importances. Okay. It makes no sense to, to speak about the value of a class of goods, the value of water or the value of chairs in general. If we want to explain really what is going on on the market, if we want to understand uh, human decision making, we need to take account of the context. Right? In a context, we have always a concrete chair, this object, for example, 
uh, in the context is defined by the presence, for example, of other chairs of this type. Uh, for example, in this room, we have uh, uh, about, I guess, 80 or so chairs of this type, which makes that the relative importance of one chair of this type is not as high or not as big as if this were the only chair of this type in the world, it would be a unicard, right? a work of art uh, made by the famous Hubert Strecker and would therefore have a surplus, a commander, a surplus value. Okay, so uh, here we have then uh, Menga's uh, take, uh, 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 the particular Mengarian edge of his uh, theory of marginal value, and Menga himself was very conscious of the fact that this was what set him apart from both Jevons and Varas. So he had read everything that Je Jevons had uh, written, he had read everything that Varas had written, he was not impressed by the mathematics, right? and he said, Okay, what is important if we want to give a truly scientific account of, of human life is that we be faithful to the observed fact, that we be faithful to the reality that we can verify. Right? And this is not what, uh, what we do in mathematics in order to apply mathematical tools to human uh, behavior, to the explanation of human behavior. We need to make various auxiliary stipulations, hypotheses, and so on lest we cannot uh, make this application. Okay, then uh, Menga has uh, uh, made one other uh, contribution that is uh, worth being mentioned. Um, namely, he gave um, an account of the origin of money that was very uh, influential both for, uh, for Mises but also for other thinkers in the 20th century. So Menga stressed that uh, money did not emerge on the market as a social convention, right? So it was not the case, well, first of all, historically, it's a historical fact, right? That there was never ever in human history a convention that came together and then decided, okay, well, we would need something that is as useful as money because it allows us to calculate the value of all things Right, in terms of a common unit. So it would be nice to have something uh, of, this, of this sort. So let's get together and we just make up an object and say, okay, now, whatever, lamps of this sort are our money or tablecloth of this sort will be our money. And it was, so it was purely uh, uh, a conventional decision to pick up the precious metals, gold and, and, or silver or any, or maybe paper money or something. Uh, that resulted then from, from human uh, deliberation and was ultimately arbitrary. Okay, it was in any case a creation of uh, of the political will. So what Menga explained was that uh, actually, okay, so first of all, the, we have the historical fact that no such convention ever took place, which brings up the question: so how did money, in fact, originate? And Menga explained that it came about. Uh, money arose as a social institution that touched, well, uh, the lives of all members of society through individual action. Okay? This money came into being because what he called indirect exchange is more useful than direct exchange. And as long as people can exchange uh, only consumer goods one against another directly, the market is very limited. Is there any way to um, er erase what I've written here? Turn the ball. Turn the <laughs> okay. So we have true scarcity. I need to ponder my words. This is all what's left for me to say here. Okay, so we have, let's say we have a person A, Paul, and person B, Peter, and Paul owns an apple, and Peter owns a pear. Right? And Paul and Peter decide to exchange the apple uh, and the pear, so that's fine. Um, what is if, if Paul would like to have the pear, but Peter doesn't like to, uh, the apple? Uh, Peter just is allergic against apples or thinks that apple trees should be a protected species and not be robbed of their fruits and so on. It would be completely different in the case of pears, by the way. Um, right? So he doesn't desire the, uh, the apple, so no exchange would take place. There's no way for would be no way for Paul to get a pair. 
Right? But there might be a way for Paul to get a pair if he can find out, well, what is it that Peter would actually like? What Would he be ready to exchange his uh, pair against? And he finds out that Peter likes French cheese. So, he gets in touch with Francois. Not Francois Mitterrand, because he never exchanged anything useful in his life. But um, uh, some other Francois. And exchanges his apple against the cheese, and then takes the cheese to exchange it against Peter's, Peter's pear. Okay. Then in this case, the cheese is what is called a means of exchange, right? And um, so we have here an indirect exchange, which extends the market, which creates a greater market than would otherwise have existed. And since this is a, therefore a useful technique to attain one's ends, it is likely that other people will start imitating the same technique, right? And as a consequence, uh, the practice of indirect exchange becomes ever more widespread. And as a consequence of this, people will also tend to select the most useful, physically useful uh, commodities to perform indirect exchanges, which explains in turn why gold and silver and uh, precious metals in general have been selected by the market as media of exchange. And they have become money, right? money being a generally accepted medium of exchange. Okay, so this was the Mengarian uh, theory and it was, was interesting because it explained that how general social institutions emerged through individual action and became general uh, through a process of imitation. Okay. Now, uh, very briefly about Böhm-Barwerk, because we need to move on and talk a little bit about Mises at least. Böhm-Barwerk, well, uh, was probably the most famous Austrian economist of his generation. Uh, he was four times the head of the Austrian Ministry of Finance. And most of all, uh, what is interesting for us was that he was uh, one of Mises' main teachers. He was certainly the, the teacher that inspired him most. So Mises took part in böhm Bavak's seminar at the University of Vienna uh, from 1905 to 1913. And um, uh, well, böhm had um, obtained a chair at the University of, of Vienna, yet after his last term as, as the Minister of Finance, he got the, an offer from various banks and become one of our chief executives and so on because he had political connections and so on. He could have made a lot of money. He said, no, forget about this. I've, no, no, this what interests me most is science. So he became a professor again. And he had a great group of students, Mises among them. Now, Bim uh, is, uh, uh, work, you should retain three, uh, three elements. Most of all, he has developed a theory of capital and interest, an original theory of capital and interest. Most importantly here, he has explained the interest rates on the market as a consequence of what he called, well, time preference. Actually, he didn't use this expression. It was invented later by an American economist by the name of Frank Fetter. Okay, but this was Ben Babak's explanation. Present goods have a higher value than future goods. Right? This was a value phenomenon that uh, Ben Babak posited. And in light of this value phenomenon, we could explain interest rates emerging on the market. Then Ben Babak become, uh, also became uh, a celebrity through his critique of uh, Marxist economics. Right? Uh, Karl Marx, during his lifetime, had just published one volume of Das Kapital. Uh, and the other two volumes were published after his death by his friend Frederick Engels. So after the publication of the third volume, when the Marxian system was complete, uh, Böhm Barwerk published uh, a critique that was very influential, very smashing at the time, and uh, is still uh, a good reading today. Right? So still, if you want to have a first critical grasp of, uh, of the uh, problems of uh, Marxist economics, Böhm Barwerk's essay is still uh, the way to start. And what Böhm Barwerk observed in particular was that there's a contradiction between observed reality and um, the uh, postulates of, of Marx's theory. Right? According to Marx, uh, the interest rate is 
an exploitation premium, so to say, right? It's squeezed out of the workers. Now, if this is true, then of course um, uh, the profit or the, or the interest rate that any capitalist can make depends essentially on the proportion of workers as compared to capital. Right? The higher the number of workers, uh, the more profit it should, it should make, um, and the lower the number of workers, the less profit or the less interest you should be able to make. Um, now, in reality, we observe, in fact, that the interest rate or the profit rates tends to equalize in all industries, irrespective of the numbers of employees. So how does this square with Marxist uh, theory? Right? So we have here a big contradiction um, that has been uh, squared by, by Marx through a fictitious uh, postulate, namely by the postulate that his theory only holds true for the aggregate. Okay, so what Marx said in the third volume explained, well, actually, okay, well, it doesn't hold true for every, every individual firm, but for all firms taken together, it holds true. Okay, but then, of course, he has abandoned uh, the project of a scientific description, or uh, scientific analysis of the operation of a capitalist economy. He has not given it, right? because how can you uh, verify or uh, falsify this, uh, uh, this assumption that it holds true for the aggregate, but not for every individual firm, right? You still have uh, left a whole uh, field unexplained, namely explaining the behavior of the individual firm, which was the initial plan of Marx to do. And then Bombavec also developed a very influential critique of interventionist policies in an essay with the title Macht oder ökonomisches Gesetz, Power or Economic Law? Question mark. So the question was whether uh, economic phenomena such as wage rates were explained by economic law or were just a function of brute political power wielded either by governments or by powerful labor unions. Uh, so the question, and that's still the great question that we have today, we have not advanced one yota beyond this, is, well, can labor unions actually be helpful in increasing wage rates? Right? And Bumbavec showed that that was not the case. Right. Uh, of course, so the, the essay, well, I cannot <laughs> talk more about this uh, because I need to move on to get to Mises finally, right? But I can only recommend that you, that you read this because it has direct applications to the social conflicts that we still have in our time and to various uh, untenable doctrines that are still being spread. Right? Labor unions have the, the power to, uh, to increase uh, wage rates. Uh, politicians have the power to Im improve uh, uh, living conditions of the masses by administrative fiat. In France, we have right now a minister uh, of economics who is ordering, by and large, the, uh, the oil companies to cut down prices right? because he knows, of course, by his, by his wisdom, what the right price for oil should be or for gasoline should be at the gas station. Okay, then Mises. So Mises um, was Bumbavec's most important disciple. He was not necessarily the, the student that Bumbavec thought was the most brilliant one. Now, that's a very encouraging thing for every one of us. Right? Uh, at least, I mean, some of us suffer from megalomania. Right? But all others who do not, who don't think that they are particularly great and and wonderful and so on, or rather have a more sober view of their own capacities and so, so on, well, uh, uh, you don't need, always need to be a genius to do wonderful and great work, right? And in the case of Mises, well, he happened to be a genius, but he was maybe not quite as much as a genius as another member of Bimbabwe Seminar, who was Schumpeter, right? So Schumpeter was especially a great, a wonderful writer. It's a pleasure to read Schumpeter still, uh, still today. And he had many, he had a very vivid mind, uh, much esprit, as the French say. Uh, and he cooked up constantly lots of, lots of ideas. The problem was that he never took the time to sort out how the ideas fitted together and how they fit together with reality. Okay? So that was Bumbavec's critique of the man whom he considered to be his most brilliant disciple, Schumpeter, that he never actually took the time to think through systematically his theories and check them against reality and against themselves. And that was something that Mises did throughout all of his life. And uh, the result was that he was the most important economist of the 20th century and not Schumpeter. 
So it's a very encouraging sign. So Mises was born in uh, what was at the time the uh, northeasternmost province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Reich, uh, namely in Galicia, uh, not to be confused with the Galicia that still exists today, northwesternmost province of Spain, it's also Galicia. Uh, so here we had Galicia uh, in Austria, and the capital was Lemberg. Today, I believe it's Lviv. Lwów. Lviv is, is Polish, right? Yes. I always confuse, I always mix this up, yeah. Uh, so Lemberg was at, at the time um, uh, inhabited um, predominantly by, uh, 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 by uh, Polish uh, bourgeoisie and by, uh, uh, by Jews. Mises' family was Jewish. And his family wa was one of those who were uh, pushing the Germanization of the eastern provinces, and especially the provinces inhabited by, by Poles, uh, because for them, German culture was the embodiment of individual liberty. Now imagine this. Right? That was in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, 50, 70 years later, Mises had, had to revise the judgment of his, of his grandfather and great-grandfather. Right? Times had changed. But at the time, so German culture was the embodiment of individual liberty and social progress and so on. So the Mises family was very active in spreading this. And of course, so that was the reason why he, although living in a predominantly Polish environment, while well, he uh, was speaking, was raised in, in German culture and was, uh, was a German writer. So most of his, virtually all of his works until 1940 were published, 14 were published in, in German. And only after his emigration to the United States, he started writing in English. I've anticipated already several things. Uh, so Mises was born there. His family moved early on to Vienna, where he was educated. He went to the university. And uh, after the university, he joined uh, the Chamber of Commerce and became the most important uh, economist within the chamber, the chief economist within the chamber, and had a large influence on Austrian politics in the interwar period. In 1934, there was a political crisis in Austria. Um, and the, the country turned increasingly totalitarian, right, almost uh, government control and so on. And at that point, Mises then accepted an in invitation to go to Geneva to um, uh, a graduate school of international relations uh, that was, in fact, the House Graduate School of the United Nations. Uh, well, no, sorry, the League of Nations at the time. Right? So the uh, League of Nations. And they needed to have a school to train all the future international administrators, Mises joined, joined this school on the chair for international economic relations. In 1940, uh, the German troops were overrunning France. Mises emigrated to the United States, uh, arrived in New York, and would stay there for the rest of his life. That is, okay, okay, he left the city from time to time for vacation and, and trips and so on, but that was his new home. Uh, and he died in 1973 in New York City. Now, uh, as far as his uh, life is concerned, uh, his, his work, is, his intellectual development is concerned, it's, uh, we have to return again to his days at the University of Vienna. And Mises here started as a, a student of a man by the name of Karl Grünberg. Can you read this green stuff here? Okay. Karl Grünberg. Who has ever heard of this name? I'm not surprised. So Grünberg uh, was a representative of what was called the German Histor Historical School. Right? This um, Historical School of Economics is a group of economists who believed that uh, economists consisted in um, uh, measuring, uh, uh, in conducting empirical field studies and somehow deriving theory from it. Right? So economics was essentially uh, a side branch. Economics was essentially a side branch of historical studies. And right? we have to study various facts, gather as many facts and information as possible, and then somehow squeeze a theory out of this. Okay, so that was Grünberg's project, and Mises became a disciple of, of Grünberg, and he was um, uh, well convinced that that was the right approach. And uh, it was only the lacking success of his uh, studies 
the of these studies, both the studies of Grunberg himself, but of his own endeavors, that uh, slowly convinced him that there was something fishy about the whole thing. Okay? And then something happened in uh, 1903, uh, in late 1903, Menger, uh, Mises read Karl Menger's book on the principles of economics and um, became a Mengarian, right, to make a long story short. And the reason why he became a Mengarian was because he now saw for the first time that there could be something like an uh, economic theory that was not just something made up, not just a set of stipulations or uh, fictitious hypotheses, but a discipline that actually described reality, right? And a discipline that answered questions that could not be answered through fact-gathering. Uh, again, right, uh, to make, uh, to put it in the, most, uh, uh, in the shortest possible form, what Mises uh, yeah. would later on say was, uh, you need historical inquiries to give a precise account of uh, the state of affairs, right, of the historical state of affairs, to give a precise account of the context in which we find ourselves. But then to understand human action itself, you need economics. Because human reaction within a given context in no way is determined, is not perfectly determined by the environment itself. Uh, there is an element uh, that comes from, human, uh, from the human beings themselves uh, and that is free from this environment. We, we, give, uh, we use the word choice right, to, to describe this reality. There is something like choice, genuine choice, there's something that's a true human liberty, which cannot be exhaustively explained or which makes that human, uh, human behavior cannot be exhaustively explained by giving a complete account of the context in which human action takes place. Okay? And so in order to analyze uh, human behavior completely, we need to have economics. And that was something that Mises realized or started realizing at the end of 1903. And so he slowly uh, became an Austrian economist and uh, published the first great fruit of his, of his new uh, outlook or his new approach in, in science in a book that he published in 1912 with the title uh, Theorie des Geldes und der Umlaufsmittel, Theory of Money and Credit. And um, so this is, this is the starting point of, uh, of his intellectual endeavors. And he, uh, there are a couple of, uh, well, let me just mention a few of his other major works. So in, um, uh, 10 years later, he published another book with the title Die Gemeinwirtschaft, Socialism, right? one of his major works. And then in 1914, 14, uh, a treatise of economics with the title Nationalökonomie, or Economics, and he published an uh, American uh, version uh, nine years later under the title Human Action. So human action is still today the most important, uh, one of the most important works within the Austrian school. And then another book, or two other books that deserve to be mentioned were uh, in 1956, a book with the title Theory and History, and in 1962, a book with the title The Ultimate Foundations of Economic Science. Both of these latter two books uh, deal with questions of methodology and, and epistemology, which became a great uh, project of, uh, of Mises starting from about 1930 or so, and I will say something about this later. Um, about his life, we should also observe that Mises was in private employment more or less throughout his entire life. He was never um, a, a full professor at a university. Right? He taught at the University of Vienna, but he was an unpaid um, adjunct professor. Okay. Uh, why did he do this? Why would he lecture without, uh, uh, without being paid? Well, because he enjoyed it and uh, because he wanted to, to spread uh, Austrian economics uh, among the ri uh, rising generation. Uh, so he had his main employment with the Chamber of Commerce and then uh, in 19... Uh, in his Geneva years, 1934 to 1940, so he was at this school, with all, which was also privately funded, essentially, namely by the Rockefeller Foundation. And then uh, in New York, he was, again, an, an adjunct professor at, the, at New York University from 1945 to 
1969, and there too, essentially, uh, his salary was being paid out of private funds. The university uh, didn't find it important enough to spend a cent on Mises. Uh, in, uh, so in 1940, I said he emigrated to the United States and then, well, eventually had this, this uh, professorship at the uh, New York University. And here he had, in, uh, in a seminar, he built up what is today uh, the Austrian school. Uh, so I talked before about main lines and side lines. Today, the main line is the most uh, uh, vigorous branch uh, in Austrian economics. And it has come to be the most vigorous branch uh, due to the, um, to the work of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, which was founded about 25 years ago. Uh, the mission of which was to spread Mises' work, Mises and, and, uh, and Rothbard's work. And the, the reason why the institute was founded was because at the, at the uh, time, the sideline was becoming more important than the, than the main line, right? So the Hayekian uh, sideline uh, was getting a boost due to the Nobel Prize being accorded to Friedrich von Hayek in 1974. Right? We, we, we obtained the Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, well, people became interested in Hayek's works and were drawn increasingly toward problems of, uh, well, the knowledge economy and uh, the spontaneous emergence of institutions, all these uh, Hayekian themes. But as a consequence, the economics um, uh, came to play a side role, right? Especially the economics developed by, by Mises and by Rothbard were uh, increasingly left aside. And so there was a market niche, so to say, in, into which the Mises Institute jumped. And, uh, and help bring about the present uh, situation. Um, due to Mises' move to the United States, um, the Mises school, or the Austrian school, insofar as it survived after 1945, was pre predominantly a Mises school. Right? Mises and his seminar uh, trained the most important uh, Austrian economists of the 1960s through, through 90s, and here I mention uh, a few names. Hans Zenholz, and then of course Rothbard, and we might also mention George Riesman, and it was especially Zenholz and Rothbard right, who continued the Austrian school and trained more Austrian economists in the, in the post-war period. And again, due to Hayek's uh, Nobel Prize in 74, this Misesian Austrian school came to be submerged under, uh, under the, the upswing of, of the side, uh, side branch. And the, it was only in the past 10, 15, 20 years that the, uh, the Austrian school in the US has become again predominantly a Mises school. So that is the situation that we have today. So presently, uh, today, we have uh, a Mises school in the United States. And in, in Europe, the situation is very different. Most people who claim or would call themselves Austrian economists in, in Europe are actually Hayekians, okay? Or they are heavily influenced by Hayek, which is, which is not, not bad. There's nothing wrong with this, right? Um, the, the thing is, uh, the problem is that Hayek never managed to write a general treatise on, uh, on economics. So Hayek's work, as far as economics is concerned, is very narrow, it concerns mainly problems of uh, monetary theory and of business cycle theory. And it stops in the 1930s, right? It stops in the early 1930s. Hayek's last book that he published on economics was in 1941, a uh, book with the title A Pure Theory of, of Capital, very difficult book. I think about 10 people in the world who have read it. Uh, and uh, so Hayek is not much of an economics. The Austrian school uh, today, as far as something that can be taught and that is really an encompassing system of, of economic analysis, exists only in two forms. Right? And it's very important to keep this in mind. One, is, one form is the book with the title Human Action, okay? which was written in 1949 by Mises. And the other book is uh, another treatise on economics with the title Man, Economy and State.
1962, and the author is Rothbard. So the importance of Mises and Rothbard uh, derives from the fact that they alone have created encompassing systems of economic analysis that can be taught right, and uh, can be the foundation of a school. Where Hayek never produced anything to this effect. And all that Hayek has left us are various sketches of uh, uh, social interpretation, in particular in his later work, Law, Legislation and Liberty, in the 1970s, or then we have a book on the constitution of liberty, which, is, uh, which are very good in their own right, but they are not systems of economic analysis. Okay? So therefore, the great problem that we had in the, in the late 1970s, when so much attention was turned to Hayek, was that the Austrian message got diluted. And people started becoming interested in all these various side issues and so on, and the hard core of economic analysis uh, disappeared from, from the attention. Right? And so today things have changed, fortunately, again, and it is time that we bring this to Europe, too. Uh, how much time do I uh, still have? Should I stop short, or do I have 15 more minutes to go? 15? Two minutes? So sh should I stop at 10.30? Okay. Yeah, well, then let me, let me, um, uh, let me briefly uh, talk about uh, some of the main aspects of Mises' work. And I'll first say something about the theory of money and credit and then move on to the other books. So in the theory of money and credit, Mises makes a couple of contributions, and I will single out uh, three of them. Uh, so the main, it was his habilitation thesis at the time, so it was the Berg on the, on the base of which he would get the, the license to teach as a professor at, the, at Austrian universities. And the main thesis was in fact a new, or concerned a new theory of the value of money. The value of money had not been explained by Menga. Right? Menga's theory was only, or Menga himself applied his theory only to real goods, consumer goods, producer goods, but not to money. So this was a field left unexplained, and various critics of the Austrian school at the time, uh, such as uh, the German economist Karl Helferich, who also became a minister of finance, uh, had argued that the Austrian theory could not, in fact, be applied to the theory of money. Only cost of production theories could explain the value of money. So what Mises did then was to show how this problem could be solved on the basis of Menger's marginal value theory. And he did so based on, on a reformulation of value theory in itself. That is, before Mises set out to apply Menger's theory or Menger's approach to, the, uh, to money, he reformulated and improved Menger's value theory. Okay. The, problem, uh, the main problem with Menger's value theory was that it was not centered in the analysis of choice. Right? Uh, as Menger has had it, uh, the value of goods was an objective quality that was a function of human needs, of discrete human needs, individual human needs. Okay? It had nothing to do with choice. And Menger actually said in the introduction of his principles that as soon as we bring choice into the picture, well, if we admit of the reality of human choice, well, the whole thing gets screwed up and there is no such thing as economic science. Okay? So what Mises then did was to show that actually the theory of marginal value itself was a theory that was entirely based on uh, the reality of choice. It was a description of the reality of choice. For what we do in, in every choice is to prefer something to another thing. Right? I do prefer, if I, if I go to a shop and buy a, a, a bread for, a, what would be the price here, for five, cor uh, five uh, coronas? <laughs> Ten? Okay. <laughs> well, you have inflation in Denmark too, right? <laughs> Okay, so if I buy a bread for 10 coronas, well then I make a choice, I prefer the bread to the 10 coronas, uh, and as a consequence, um, right, we have a value, value relation here between the bread and the 10 coronas for one individual, namely uh, me, myself. Okay, so that is the, um, uh, the foundation of, of value theory, the preference that people have for some things over for some choice alternatives or over other choice alternatives. So Mises turned Menger's value theory into a preference theory. 
And then he applied this uh, to the value of money and he showed in fact that um, uh, the main problem that was uh, perceived uh, to exist in, uh, in any attempt to apply marginal value of theory to money uh, uh, could be, could be uh, solved. Uh, the problem as people perceived it as the, as the time was that we were moving in a circle. We cannot, in order to explain um, the marginal value of money, uh, we have to assume an object that has already a purchasing power because the purpose of money is to be exchanged against other things, right? We buy other things against uh, it. Now, in order to evaluate uh, any sum of money, therefore, we need to have an idea what its purchasing power might be, okay? So the value, in order to explain the value of money, we need to have its purchasing power. And we need to know something about the purchasing power. But the point was to explain the purchasing power in terms of value. Okay, so we're moving in a circle. We want to explain the purchasing power in terms of value, right? but in order to uh, say something about uh, value, we need to know already something about the purchasing power. Right? So we seem to move in a, in a circle. And Mises showed that that was not actually true because we have here um, a determination that runs not in a circle, but that runs through time. Right, so what happens actually is that um, we know something about the purchasing power today that explains the value, marginal value of money today because uh, this purchasing power has come into being in the light of the values of the day before. Right? So it's not these values here that determine the purchasing power, but the values of the day before. Okay, The value of money as it was determined uh, by the, the day before. So then the question is, of course, we're moving back to the question, right? Uh, how come that money had this, this value the day before? Apparently, this could only be decided in the light of its purchasing power, again. But it's not this purchasing power here, but a purchasing power of a period before. Right? So Mises showed that we're not actually moving in a circle, but we are moving back in time in the determination of um, money prices. And the only question left is, is this an infinite regress, which would be a logical problem then, right? If we have an infinite regress in time. And Mises' answer was no, because there is a stopping point. Some point here, right? There's a stopping point. At the very moment when we use an object uh, as a medium of exchange that so far had not been used as money. And this object has um, a value because of its qualities as a consumer goods. At some point, for example, cheese, which had just been a consumer's good here for our friend Paul, or for Francois, was just uh, a consumer good, and at some point in history had been first used as a medium of exchange. Right? So then, only then, he had this additional value, which it obtained because it also saved, uh, uh, served as a, as a medium of exchange, because it also served as money. Right? So this was the, the way Mises uh, solve the, this problem by explaining that the determination of the value of money is diachronic. It's not within a point of time which would create a circle in the explanation. I know this is a very brief explanation, but just to give you right, the, the outline of the argument. So he did this, and in, in the book he also uh, proposed a new business cycle theory. Uh, so in business cycle theory, and we'll talk more about this uh, tomorrow, uh, the point is to explain booms and busts, right? And uh, Mises uh, developed a theory or, or showed that, um, uh, in fact, uh, monetary policy was the, the cause of the business cycle because monetary policy, or let's say banking policy, to the extent that it increased the money supply, was able to diminish the interest rate before, below its equilibrium level. And as a consequence, entrepreneurs, because of the low uh, interest, uh, comparatively low interest rate level, would make investments profitable that were not profitable before, right? If the, the interest rate decreases, interest rate is an important cost component in investment decisions. So if the interest rate decreases, then more investments will be made than would have been made instead. And these investments 
uh, well, not all of the investments will now be able uh, to, to be, to be com completed. Right? Because all that we have done is to increase the quantity of money thus decreasing the interest rate, but we have not thereby increased the quantity of real goods and services that are needed to complete these investment projects. Right? So, um, the increase of the money supply has deluded the entrepreneurs. It has created a mass error. Entrepreneurs do things now that they should not have done. They cannot complete all these projects into which they throw themselves. So it must come sooner or later to a situation in which this impossibility, this physical impossibility, will become apparent. And that's the crisis. You have a question? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that was very brief. Tomorrow I have a lecture on business cycle theory, so we'll I'll explain the same thing in much more detail, okay, and I'll also talk about this point. Okay, so we have Mises business cycle theory, and um, I have a few more minutes, so I'll just mention a few other of his contributions. Uh, in his book, uh, 1922, on socialism, Mises uh, gave an analysis of the uh, ob objective um, uh, of, of, of private property, of the, the role of private property within a capitalist economy, and showed that the beneficiaries of capital goods are in fact the, the consumers. Right? That although we have private property for, for uh, producers' goods, for machines and, uh, and great uh, production sites and so on, they are all privately owned, but the true beneficiaries are not these owners, they are the consumers of the consumer goods that can be con uh, produced ultimately with the help of, of, these, uh, of these sites. So that's a big difference between capitalism and uh, feudalistic systems of social organization that existed before. Uh, so most importantly then, Mises also in the same book uh, uh, developed a, a, a theory that he had, uh, proposed two years before, in 1920, one of the most famous economics articles in the 20th century, an article with the title, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And here Mises explained that um, uh, socialist uh, systems, socialist societies, could not allocate uh, resources rationally because they would not have the, the instrument of economic calculation. Economic calculation as we know it is a profitability calculus. That right? is, we determine the profit rates that we expect for each investment alternatives. And uh, uh, these profit uh, rates are calculated in terms of money prices. Right? We confront the anticipated monetary returns from our uh, project to the anticipated expenditures on factors of production. Right? And then we get a profit rate. Now, the problem in socialism is that by definition, we have just one owner of all means of production. So as a consequence, there can be no exchange of means of production. And as a consequence, there can be no market prices for means of production. Okay? So you cannot calculate any profit rate. Right? So contrary to what was at the time the great allegation of the socialists that, well, capitalism was squandering resources, and was utterly inefficient, and you just need to organize the uh, entire society from according to one plan, right? the effective result would be the exact opposite. It would not be more rational to do, it would be less rational, because they could no longer calculate. So you would have utter anarchy of socialism, right? It was not anarchy of the market, you had anarchy of socialism and the sense of complete disorder. Only the market economy was orderly, because only there you had economic calculation. Now the book is, uh, is actually much richer than this, so there are also, um, Mises here also develops monopoly theory, and he develops another, he pioneers another fashionable topic today, namely gender relations, okay? Uh, the economic relations between ma men and females and marriage in particular and so on. So Mises talks about this, I can only encourage you to have a look at, at this. And then there's one last uh, contribution that we should mention, namely Mises' views on epistemology. So Mises held, in clarification of, of Menger's view about economics as a, uh, as a descriptive, realistic discipline, that economic laws were actually a priori. That is, they did not depend on the observations that we make. That is, the evidence underlying economic laws is not the evidence of the senses, what we see, what we hear, and what we smell. It's uh, evidence that we know about 
human action, about the structural features of human action, in particular that human beings choose. Right? The fact that human beings choose, we do not know through observations. We cannot observe a choice, impossible. Right? We cannot observe means and ends, impossible. Still we know that these things do exist. Right? So a priori, according to Mises then, relates to the fact that when Mises says economic theory is a priori, it means that it holds true independent of the observations that we uh, make, that is the evidence that we get through the senses. Now this, um, this opinion of Mises has, been, uh, 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 has raised much more opposition than his views on socialist calculation and monetary theory and so on. It has uh, uh, led to utter incomprehension on the side of virtually all mainstream economists. Uh, it's a very famous remark that Milton Friedman once made, made about Mises and said, well, look, I mean, this is plainly ridiculous to hold that economic theory is not an empirical discipline but, but a priori. Right? How can, in this way, how can conflicts ever be settled if two praxeologists cannot agree on a proposition? Well, there's only one, one way out, shoot it out. Okay? Cannot, I mean, if you, if you don't uh, decide your, your uh, disagreement on the basis of facts, well, you just have to shoot it out. Uh, well, I can only say one thing. So I lived in, in Alabama for about six years. We, we have very liberal gun laws. Okay. <laughs> so I myself was a customer of a very nice gun shop in town, and uh, well, several gun shops in town. And even you as a tourist, you could go there and buy a gun and right, could show them up at the Mises Institute conference and then settle uh, any conflicts you might have with other praxeologists <laughs> according to the Friedmanian precept. Okay? Now, the, the, the empirical fact is that this never happened once. Okay? That's an empirical fact. So we should say that, that at least Friedman's theory is not corroborated by the facts. Uh, and then, of course, the second observation that we have to make is that, of course, conflicts uh, among positivists Scientist, economists, uh, positivists uh, of, of Friedman's sort, who claim that they settle everything according to the empirical re record, have never been settled either. Both monetarists and Keynesians have been struggling for decades, right? I mean, uh, f three or four decades. And they're constantly debating on the true meaning and the right interpretation of the empirical record. Right? So, I mean, uh, whatever uh, the deficiencies of Mises' view are, uh, in, in bringing about agreements about economists, well, uh, the positivist camp is at least as deficient. Right? They have not brought about agreements either. Now, this point, I will, I will uh, close with this. So this point is really what, what sets uh, the Austrian school, in particular the Misesians, today apart from everybody else. Right? It's still this uh, question of method or epistemology. Right? Menga starts off in distinct contrast to Jevons and Varas, on the other hand, with a project of a realist economic theory, a theory that is really descriptive of, of reality. And this is the project that has been continued uh, throughout the uh, generations of Austrian economists, has been developed in particular by Mises, but is developed today by, uh, by Professor Hoppe and others. Right? And uh, so we'll uh, learn more about this uh, in the last lecture today, before the wedding, on uh, praxeology. Thank you for your attention.